There you are. You, are. <laughs> you know, being over 30, it makes it difficult. You know, the technology is a challenge. Hi, Marjolaine. Hi. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I'm in a hotel right now. We're Hello. With, um, I don't need to know. Hello. Yes. Are you there, Vanessa? Um, this is Jenny, actually. <gasps> Hi, Jenny. How are I don't you? look like Jenny. You, you don't look, <laughs> Jenny, why, we can't see you. Oh, okay. I, she's just, Vanessa's just run off to get me some water. Okay. Well, hi, Jenny. Hi. Um, we're so happy that you took the time um, okay. for, for us. Um, there you are, looking lovely. Um, uh, I just want to say before a uh, little preface, you know, um, less than a year ago, uh, Peter Vernon um, messaged me and said, that the viewership in America was growing because of Acorn, and I had been active on the page, and would I please start um, an American page? So that was it at the end of September of last year, and I said, if we get 100 people, I will be so excited. Well, here we are 10 months later, and we are just about to hit 1,000 members from all over the world. We mm -hmm. have... Um, 18 countries, uh, 38 of our 50 states, and we are growing. People are seeing it more and more. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to visit with us. And I know thank people have lots of questions because you, are, you do play one of the most talked about characters. <laughs> wanted to talk to me at all. Oh. <laughs> well, here's, here, here's my first question for you. Um, your, your, what does your hashtag misunderstood tell us about that? <laughs> well, you know the golden rule of acting, you must never judge your character. So you have to kind of feel empathy for them in order to play them. So I, I guess how I feel about Regina is that she is misunderstood and and if only people could see inside her 15-year-old brain, because that's kind of how old I pitch her in terms of her emotional maturity, then they would understand why she behaves the way she does. I mean, she's ultimately heartbroken. That is, that is kind of what guides her throughout her life, is this terrible sense of, I didn't get the man that I loved. So she's misunderstood in that way because people think she's just this terrible villain. Uh, well, uh, we're, we're going to have an opportunity for you to talk yourself out of that concept that we have. Um, can you tell us, um, I'm very curious about um, your audition for this part. Um, you, you seem like such a nice lady. What oh, did you, you but what, only just met me. Now, what did you have to call? I mean, what was your preparation for this audition? And what in your own life did you call on to um, create this conniving, cruel, manipulative, cunning woman that we well, all love to hate? That would be telling, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. I mean... To be quite honest, it was a shock that I got the role because, firstly, I didn't know the, the breadth of Regina when I auditioned for her. She was just it was a five-episode guest role and she was, um, you know, an in-law relative of the Bly family. And I guess it was, it's been a journey of discovery between me and Bevan to see what Regina was going to become. So when I auditioned, I guess what he really wanted to see from me was this sense of entitlement that's kind of what we brought when we first started which was I'm owed and, and I need I'm entitled to be given certain things and, kind of, and that's kind of where we started from with her. Um, uh, Jenny meet Donna Devine. Um, Donna is um, from Connecticut and I, um, we have some really animated conversations about Jenny and the kind of person she is so um, Donna say hi to Jenny. Hi, I, I'm, I'm uh, glad to have the opportunity to say shalom to you. <laughs> shalom. Uh, and uh, that's part of my question. Uh, we've, we've had chats with other members of the cast, and we asked what in their background, what they read, what they viewed, uh, uh, that helped them really uh, absorb the character. And in our chat with Bevan Lee, 
he talked about how he uh, uh, envisioned your character as both psychotic <laughs> with echoes of Hitler. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us just how you uh, decided to play the role of this anti to project the anti-Semitism uh, and, and yeah. why um, add the word, you, you, you often add the word shalom, which to me sometimes makes the, uh, the, the character a bit campy. And I'm wondering who decided to add that word. I, I, <laughs> um, well, that's all Bevan, obviously. Um, if I were to be very honest, I, I would have to say I lived in Los Angeles for eight years. And um, a lot of my friends are Jewish and they live in L.A. And, and we also, I also have a lot of Israeli friends in L.A. Um, and so when I, when I saw the role, I, f I, was, I was uncomfortable at the beginning. And I would talk to my husband, and I was like, you know, and he, having lived in LA for twenty years, he's like, you can't, you can't do that, you can't, you can't say that on television, <laughs> you just can't. And um, and so I, it, it took, it took, a kind of a, a lot of, I don't know how to describe it, but I, I ha kind of had to get my guts together and say, can I do this? Can I actually represent this, this ugliness? Because you know, so many of my close, close friends are Jewish, and and this, and I was uncomfortable with it, but. But then when I gave it a lot of thought, I also feel, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the Jewish community often feel relief that, that the prejudice is being spoken to. I mean, I mean you, can, you can tell me if that's incorrect, but I feel that there's a relief out there that it's like, God, this is actually what we suffered and, and still suffer. And finally, you know, it's being articulated. Um, Jenny, you know, um, in the Jewish community, um, there's a great commitment to, I've heard, sure you've heard the expression, never forget, that yeah. the stories of the Holocaust must continue to be told. And we live at a time where, unfortunately, there are people who deny the Holocaust and are trying to somehow uh, change history. Yeah. And the approach to talking about um, the Holocaust is one that we must, must do it. And however it is portrayed, as long as it's being put on the lips of people and the stories are being told, it's important. You know, Mel Brooks um, has a humorous approach because he figures we should be laughing about it. But we need to continue to talk about it. And if you... Um, were to see some of the discussion that goes on on the page, it is the one theme that keeps coming up over and over and over again. So talking about it, and for me as a Jew, and for the tremendous Jewish following that there is for the show, the Holocaust really speaks to us, and your portrayal of the character allows us to see it um, and anti-Semitism of today in a very real way. So um, as heinous as you are, as the character, um, the fact is that you're bringing the subject up and there are so many people on the page who keep asking questions and say, I, we didn't really know about this and this is so important that it's being told. So it's not all bad. Yeah, well that's, that's good. I guess, I guess that's, that's the place I've arrived at with it. Um, so on this note, Gail Siegel is in Jerusalem. Hi, Gail. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Jenny. Talk to Jenny, Gail. My question for you has to do with being a villainess. Have you ever <laughs> played one before, and how did you prepare for this role? No, this is my first villain. Um, if I were, you know, if I were to call her that. Um, I probably don't ever want to go back to playing a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think I've ever had this much fun on a TV show ever before. I don't know if you know any parts of my earlier career, but what is extraordinary about the role that I play for me personally is that Australia got to know me as a super, super sweet, blonde, single mom 
kind of heart on her sleeve character. I played that character on a show here called All Saints for 100 episodes. And so I then left after I did, did All Saints and I went to America and I came back and this has been my first role back in Australia. So people really only have that mm -hmm. former character as a reference on me. And, I, and I, I still wonder how they are reconciling the two. Or even if they know it's me. <laughs> they even know it's, it's me back from All Saints playing Regina, I'm not sure. Well, you're doing a great job at, at it. Uh, your fans love and hate you at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't really think I have any fans, to be honest. <laughs> but, but, um, but thank you. That's very nice of you to say. Welcome. We all love to hate you. We love to, to hate you. And your, your um, scenes are eaten up with great joy by 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 everyone did you hear what she said <laughs> did, did she funny. really did she really really say that um I, I rehearse my scenes in the makeup trailer just before i go on and and even the makeup artists are like god you're a bitch <laughs> such a bitch <laughs> um how does the transformation, the physical transformation, the, diff the different hair color and the clothes and all of that, um, is that part of the preparation? It, while you're sitting there in the chair or when you, you're standing in the wardrobe department, are you going through a mental transformation as these physical changes are, are made? Yes, it's a very interesting question and it really is a good question for me personally um, as an actor. I think everybody, after working with me over time, especially the first assistant directors, I would say, all know I have a real quirk about me in my work and that is, is that I will not step foot on the set without my character's shoes on. And I don't know if any of you are actors or not, but when I trained as an actor, they put a lot of emphasis on how what kind of shoes you wear impacts you as an as a character and how you move and because i am a very physical performer in terms of my key into regina is how she physically is then my shoes are the beginning of that story so yes so for me i mean you know having such super dark hair and having my hair and rollers every morning and doing a hot set and getting that kind of wildly glamorous makeup on and wearing those amazing costumes it all starts from the shoes and it goes upwards and it does create Regina utterly and I cannot be her without all of those elements I just can't wow. there have been shots of your feet and your your shoes in the uh, in, in in several of the episodes yeah yeah um, please Maybe they um, Please post some Instagram pictures of you, of of uh, Regina's feet, please. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've had to be I have to be very careful what I post. I can't give away anything. Oh, uh, not a story. Just we just want to see the feet. Uh, well, maybe after the season starts, you can start um, sharing yeah. sharing um, sharing the feet uh, the feet with us. Um, Jane Sullivan is down south in Georgia. Um, Jane. Say hello to Jenny. Hey, Jenny. Hi, Jane. I thought, it, I thought it was pretty exciting when you liked my tweet, but this is way more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing? I'm doing great. I wanted to know about how it is uh, bringing your kids on set. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, very yes. interesting. Again, um, yeah. I, I almost, I'm, I'm so looking forward to seeing how you guys will react to the last two episodes of season four and try and remember this conversation when you get to watch it. I would not allow the children to visit me on set for episode 11 and 12. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> if that indicates anything, I just, I said to my husband, I said, I, they can't come for the final block. I, I can't have them. Usually I can have them there because, you know, I can be with them in the trailer and then I can take my time. But for, for the last block, I, it was impossible for me to have my kids there. I had to, I had to remain in a place that was not very mummy friendly. <laughs> uh, um, I'm, I am the wife and mother of um, working actors. And I know that when my daughter was young, um, 
seeing her father on television was kind of a confusing thing. Um, I assume that your children, I know they're very young and that they have not uh, been introduced to Regina, but have they seen you do a commercial or anything else? Have, can they, have they connected that mommy is the woman in the box? Not really. Uh, my daughter did see something. I'm trying to remember back, and all she did was just laugh hysterically. I think she was just so, so I didn't know how to process it. And my little boy has watched me once on morning television, and all he did was cry. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, they are, they are, they are still young, and I think um, it might take a couple of years until they're ready. They certainly can't watch Regina. For sure, for sure. Um, um, we know that your husband is a successful screenwriter. Um, and again, you know, I'm, we are a show business family and there are a lot of challenges that come along with it. Um, I don't know how it is in Australia, but certainly in Hollywood and in New York, um, it, it, being in this business is, is a very challenging one. Um, how, how are you guys doing with it? Yeah, it's really tough because my husband's work is all out of the U.S. and you know, for now, all of my work is all of my work is out of Australia. So we are doing a very funny dance. He goes to LA probably once a month, mm -hmm. and after um, after the show launches this year, we'll go back and we'll be in LA for a, a bit of a time for him. Excellent. Um, Marjolene is say hello to Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Marjolene. How are you doing? Oh, tell her where you are. And uh, uh, I'm in a hotel in Amsterdam. Yeah, I'm wow. from Holland. Yes, I'm from Holland. And on behalf of all the Dutch fans, I must say hi. Hi, hi. Um, I am in a Amsterdam hotel because um, later today I'm gonna meet uh, our friend Jenny Goodwin. She's oh, uh, from Australia. Yes, from Australia. Yeah. She's on yeah. tour and cruise in Europe. And uh, today she's in Amsterdam, and I'm gonna meet up with her. Oh, how lovely! That's so special that she'll have somebody to meet up with when she arrives. That's great. All because of the show. <laughs> well, I'm surprised that you want to talk to me because I mean, isn't Marta your poster girl? <laughs> <laughs> we are fans of the show, not all because of Marta. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to? Do you want to know something funny about me and Marta? Yes. We're actually friends in real life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad you are having a friend. <laughs> we had dinner together on, on one of our last nights together in Camden. Great. Marjolene, what's your question? Well, I really don't have a question. I only want to say that I am a big fan of Regina. Uh, Thank you. Not, <laughs> not because she's... She's a bitch, but because I, it is only make believe, and yeah, I like the way you perform. You do that. Oh, thank so you. I want to say that to you. Oh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm very touched. I'm very touched that you would say that. Um, Jenny, and, and there are friendships made because of, of the show. Well, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yes. All around the world, I, I find it amazing too. Um, I, I want to comment on that um, it really is an extraordinary thing you know I've been um, uh, around television shows and and fans for over 25 years and I have never seen anything like the group of people who have been brought together um, because of a place to call home and it's truly extraordinary and I know that you get to see it in Australia because you go to fan events and um, you see people at award shows and at picnics and that kind of thing. But there's a whole world out there outside of Australia that has bonded over this show and real friendships have been formed. Um, people are meeting up. Uh, Gail was um, in New York a few weeks ago from Jerusalem and she got to meet up with Donna Devine um, in the city and I'm going to Israel at the end of August and I'm planning on finding an Australian bar in Jerusalem and meeting up with all of our uh, Israeli, Israeli fans. Um, 
a lot of it has to do with the extraordinary um, way that the st- the stars have responded to their fans. Um, you you've been incredibly accessible. Um, the fact that you're taking time to do a chat like this um, is really um, it's it's quite extraordinary. And when this chat gets posted after we finish talking a thousand people are going to be able to hear it and are going to be able to talk about it and really feel a close connection. I also think that the Australian Tourist Board should really be giving you guys like lots of props, free um, plane tickets and all that kind of thing. Um, because, Because there are fans who are flocking to Australia and it never occurred to them to go to Australia before a place to call home. So, um, it's it's bizarre because we have so many other shows, you know, I I don't know what it is about this particular show above, you know, any other Australian show. Well, Donna, what do you think about that? I have a few ideas about that. I mean, I, I think those of us living through the, you know, the early part of the 20th, first century are living with enormous change, you know, much more rapid than, um, uh, the kind of this, the, the pace of change before, but here you have a story about a country that most of us didn't know very much about, even those of us who are reasonably well educated, um, uh, at least in the United States. And it talks about the enormous social changes that people are forced to endure, to somehow live through, um, and they don't necessarily live through it smoothly, but we can see that you don't fall apart either. Um, You know, that, that change has come against the forces of tradition, you can't hold it back. It's like trying to hold back the ocean, but that life didn't fall apart. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you can, I, th- I think when you look at that kind of change, you begin to try to repair what's still left of the, uh, uh, of the negative parts, but you're also making the people who live there very meaningful very meaningful because those are voices that would have been lost yeah. um, just just because of history uh, mm-hmm. so that's what that's what i think i mean i think it's I, i'm a, a professor <laughs> of middle east politics and um, husband <laughs> I, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm addicted to this i was in israel a couple of uh, weeks ago and i talked to artists who were watching the show and translators who were watching the show it's it's really uh it's brilliant and and you all should be given lots of awards for for communicating the brilliance of the idea to yes. us mm-hmm. thank you thank you that's so great of you to say um, Jenny, um, we don't we, we get to see some of the press. You know, people are always posting articles and things that you know show up in um, in uh, you know Australia TV magazines and whoever's writing about it. Um, have there been the there's been a, some really thoughtful articles? Is a woman from the Wall Street Journal who just loves a place to call home, and there's uh, another woman, Pam Stuckey, who from the Huffington Post who just loves it and they've really kind of tried to capture why this Australian drama is so popular um, outside of the outside of Australia what's your take on it um, I can you mentioned you know why is an Australian show so popular well what do you think you've you've lived in LA and you know what Hollywood is like um, why do you think this particular show has 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 captured the the imagination of of Hollywood? Well, I mean, I've I've watched Mad Men for one thing. Oh. That's something um, not similar, I guess, but you know, it's a period drama, and it you know started in the fifties and really kind of examined that decade. And that decade in American history is also uh, a decade of extreme change. You know, it, before the sixties hit. And the 60s were so radical um, for America and for the world, really. 
and so I guess I, I've watched Mad Men and I've watched our show and I've been like, they're, they are different. They are very different beasts. I feel on and on when I look at the show and I try and talk about it is that it really, in a way, it's kind of uncomfortable for us as Australians to look at like, on one level because it really it shows, it holds a mirror up to what, we went through in the 50s and all the prejudices that existed in Australia and I'm only going to speak about Australia because that's my home country and that's where I'm from you know the 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 plight of the homosexual in the 50s in Australia the the class struggles and and you know all the prejudices that the upper classes had over the lower classes Australia often um, likes to propaganda itself and say that there was no there is no class difference but in fact there is and I think this the show really does speak a lot to that and I think people feel challenged by it. You know, I also think it's an important thing for us to look at where we come from in terms of are we different now? Have we moved through those struggles or haven't we? What are our prejudices like, what are our prejudices like today versus what, what were they like then? I mean, I know talking to David Berry and... and Bevan and that particular storyline is so illuminating because what what the homosexual community went through in the 50s and how they had to remain hidden and that was also incredibly painful and I think it's important that we acknowledge that what we've what we've been what we went through you know we can't forget that we've we've fought all those fights and, and we are where we are now I mean th that being said I still think prejudice exists in Australia and I think that's important that we acknowledge that too because how else do we become better as a nation. So how long will it take Australia to um, come along with America and Ireland and have marriage equality? I would hope tomorrow, you know, I guess it's one of my big issues, especially having lived in the States, coming back to Australia, I am frustrated by the fact that we're kind of stuck in the dark ages in that, in that way. Um, Fran, are you there? <clears throat> Hi, yes, I'm here. Hi. Fran's in London. Fran, say hello to Jenny and have your long-awaited chat with her. Good hello. Morning. Good morning, Hi. Jenny. Hi. Um, I was going to ask you about um, accent. Um, on the show, as Regina, um, as person um, of social class and education, um, she speaks with a cultivated Australian accent, I believe it's called, as yes. opposed to broad um, or a general yep. Australian yep. accent. Yep. Yep. And I was wondering, um, how do you go about doing that? Is that something that comes naturally to you to, to, to put that accent on? Or is it something that you had to have special um, help with, um, speech training? Um, is it, you know, you have some long monologues where you have to speak in this accent. Is it very difficult? Uh, it was probably more challenging at the beginning because I'd, I'd been living in the States for such a long mm -hmm. time and so really it was funny, I, I I returned and then I was like, what is my own voice, you know, because, <laughs> uh, you know, when I work in America, I, I don't ever show my Australian accent, so I had I had years and years and years of pretending to mm -hmm. be American, which is funny, I'm sure, to the Americans here in this conversation. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so at the beginning I was like, oh, yes, okay. Well, I went to a really toffee girls' school in Sydney, if that helps. So I just went, okay, cast my mind back to then and and the language in its formality and also my acting training was also, you know, we did Shakespeare and we did all those formal texts. And so I kind of combined it all mm -hmm. in order to get to where I needed to go with Regina. And plus... Um, I've been told by Americans in my Hollywood career that my Australian accent's appalling. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I don't know. Um, go figure. I think my Australian accent's pretty good. Uh, could have fooled me. <laughs> you, um, <laughs> what do, do we you, know? <laughs> uh, I also wondered, do you speak any French? I know on, on the show that um, you, I, I've heard, I remember a few times, um, some French. Do you speak French yourself? I don't speak French, but I speak Danish. Ah, ah, that's an. Uh, how did you come? Yeah. How did you come to speak Danish? I was an exchange student, so I I, I went and did my last year of high school in um, Denmark. Um, Jenny, um, getting back to Regina, um, can you share with us a little more 
of her backstory, uh, the things that we don't know about her um, that y- either you created or that Bevan presented to you um, that would make us maybe understand her just a little bit more? Well, I don't know if you remember back in season two when Regina paid her boyfriend to beat her up. Mm -hmm. Um, Just a casual little storyline they threw my way. Um, (laughs) And he comes out of the farm having just been right royally beaten black and blue and she has a monologue at the car. And that, that's really, that sums her up a lot, that monologue where she says, you know, I was, I, he could have been mine, he should have been mine, I would have had everything, the house, the children, the land, the money, his heart, everything, and, and, I, and my sister took it away from me. And I can't really give too much away now because it will ruin the storyline, but, but Bevan did extrapolate quite a lot on Regina's backstory throughout season four in a kind of unusual manner and I'm, I'm going to ask him once the series airs if he might release some of what he and I created together in a kind of different form this, than television in a different form that he has which will be very illuminating but um, Regina was, has loved George from the moment she laid eyes on him and the only reason why she didn't get him was she was too young and he couldn't he couldn't show an interest in her because she was 15, so he had to go for her older sister, who's a way more boring person in reality. And probably not as pretty, let's be honest. So, all things, you just had to sit back and watch her sister take the love of her life and go and have children with him, and it killed her. It absolutely killed her. I don't think she's ever gotten over it. Can you tell us anything about the late Mr. Standish? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we've had a lot of uh, discussions about uh, when he may have expired. I'm, I'm not going to talk about how he expired, but um, because when you're first introduced, you're just coming out of mourning in season one. So we assumed it was. 1952 or thereabouts that he uh, died. And then there, in, uh, Sir Richard says something about the Zionists having done him in and uh, with the explosion at the King David, and that would put it at 1946. So we, we've had deep discussions about <laughs> well, when, when... It's not clear whether it was my husband that died in that bombing or if it was just friends and friends colleagues. yeah that's uh because because there was another conversation between elizabeth and prudence right about right we, we what, know about that yeah <laughs> yeah what happened to my husband and i was also quite comfortable meeting doris and helping her with her tonic <laughs> 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 so um i think i've had some experience in that field i don't think that was my first first time with a little packet of powder. Uh, Well, uh, Aunt Regina has been looking for a way to get George back ever since. Um, And we know, actually, we know a little bit about the first Mrs. Bly. Um, Not a whole lot. She died in an explosion. They were across the street or, uh, and and he speaks of her with great love and um, affection. But somebody's dead you love them so much more and you think so much more of them afterwards um i can't wait to see what um what evolves in um season four um well i couldn't couldn't work out why he didn't meet regina and think my poor dead wife and you're a dead ringer for her pardon the pun so i feel like you and i should get together i don't know why that didn't happen Hmm. it wouldn't have made so annoying that some nurse popped into the picture, really. It wouldn't have made for nearly as good a story. You know, everybody gets happy and gets what they want. That's the end. Uh, <laughs> exactly. You, might, you need Regina. You, you, need, you need a little bit yeah. of grit. 
Um, I don't want her to. Be, I don't want her being carted off to jail until the very last moment of the series. You know, everybody <laughs> says when they talk about her and they say, "Oh, we hate her so much. Why doesn't somebody?" You know, and I keep saying because if she disappears, there is no story anymore. So we need her hanging on until the very last breath of the of the series. Um, Kathy, are you there? Kathy. Kathy is um, sitting quietly. Um, uh, Kathy is our uh, lone Australian um, on the chat today. She's putting on her earphones, and I'm. Uh, you, Kathy, Kathy. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Okay. Hi, David. My son is here as well. We have I can our, see him. Yes. We have to leave our microphone off so that we don't have echo because we're okay. recording it, he's recording it. So okay. I'd just like to say that those Americans don't know what they're talking about. The Australian <laughs> accent is wonderful. My <laughs> accent is very broad compared to yours. And I find there's very few Americans can do an Australian accent. Very few can do one convincingly when I see them on TV. It's a hard accent to do, I agree. Mm. Much easier to do an American one, I'd say. Not that I um, do one. No, I met well, you down. I um, met you down Jenny, you know, on talk shows, they... I'm sorry, I thought you were finished. I'm sorry, Kathy, uh, Kathy I'm, I'm not hearing you. I, I, did, I thought you had finished. I'm sorry. Oh, I just wanted to say, I met you down at the garden party, briefly, oh. with all the thousands of people who were there. Yeah, yeah it was a wonderful day. It was a yeah. great day. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'll uh, pass you back, uh, pass back to um, Susan now. Um, Jenny, on, on um, talk shows here, and um, you know that you have celebrity after celebrity after celebrity on the multitude of talk shows that that grace our TV screens twenty four seven. Um, in the search for uh, looking for new things to ask people, they uh, like to play um, these games, word association, and uh, um, so I want to throw out some things to you and. See what you say. Do you want um, to be me or Regina? Uh, um, no, I, I think we I think we want to I think well. Let's start with. Um, uh, well, you do have some. Regina does have some complex relationships, but tell us about working with Noni Hazelhurst. Um, somebody said to me when I got the job, they said, "If you're ever in trouble, Noni is your girl." And. Luckily, there's only been one really sticky moment on the show for me, and I remember I was in a scene with Noni, and I I said to her, Noni, I need I need you, and you need to step off with me, and she did, and she was so right there in my corner, and I think I've appreciated that ever since. That happened quite early on. She's kind of like that warm, motherly presence on set. Um, she's just earthed. It's nothing, you know, she remains grounded at all times, which I think is really important for our show. You know, we have a lot of young people and we have a lot of guest cast that come through and I think it's really, she's a really grounding presence. So I love Noni. I love working with her and um, I really feel that everyone will be very upset after they see what Regina does to <gasps> Elizabeth. <gasps> Well, uh, so tell us, let's talk about the relationship between Elizabeth and Regina, which started out with them wanting to accomplish the same things, and now their, their relationship has completely changed. Well, Elizabeth brought Regina into the fold. I mean, she wanted somebody to do her dirty work, and do her dirty work Regina did. So exactly. it was... You know, you got to be careful who you invite in because once they're in, it's not necessarily easy to get rid of them. And that's why the episode that Regina is introduced was called Cane Toad. And I don't know if you know about right. what Cane Toad right. is Australian terms. It was it's a pest, but it was introduced to deal with a different kind of pest, which is often how these things happen. And so now there's no way of getting rid of the Cane Toad. So mm -hmm. it was very apt. Um, what you say about Noni, we've been so fortunate um, that um, we've been able to have wonderful constant interaction with Noni. 
we've had yeah. certainly live chat, but she jumps on the page and she's always making, you know, comments that get us going. And um, she's participated in so many ways. We we just love her. Uh, I have a hashtag, bring Noni to the U.S. Um, because uh, we would just love to, to see her there. Um, we all love, love, love Bevan Lee. And we uh, loved him before, but when he came and spent over an hour and a half with us, we were just totally smitten and totally caught up with him. What is it about him that makes him so unique? I think Bevan is probably one of the most openly vulnerable people in our industry that I've come across. And there's so much strength to be found in that. I think it's it's such an admirable quality. You kind of you can almost see his heart when you're with him. You know, he, he he comes to our table reads and he sits at the top of the table and he talks about the show and you don't we've it, don't, it never feels like, you know, he's our boss and we're his employees or it never has that kind of power dynamic to it ever. You just kind of feel like we're all voicing one of his really personal dreams. That's kind of what it feels like. And so I think it takes the fear away because of the way he is. How unique is this program for you all? I mean, it seems so unusually unique in, in terms of the Facebook and, and the discussions we have, but how unique is it for you as actors to be a oh, part of totally, this? it's totally unique. I mean, as, as a product, it's unique. The way it looks is unique. I mean, it looks like a feature film every episode. Mm. I mean, you know, I've done a lot of Australian television, and and you know, I've done I've done television in America too, and I and I I'm always stunned at how much artistry is as it goes into it in terms of all the the cinematography, for example. So for that, it really stands apart. I think they put a lot of um, a lot of effort into that, a lot of money into that. I think you can see it all on the screen too. The, the, it, Go ahead, Donna. Oh, you know, you're, you're right that it is unique. Um, television in America, you know, people say there's good and there's bad about it, but it's the photography, the way it's presented is so, so amazing. The sweeping scenery and the horses and the galloping and the, it's so unique. It is like watching a, um, a, a feature film every 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 week. Yeah. The attention to detail, the clothes are so, and we see it so clearly that every single little detail, the accessories, the buttons on the clothes, all of these things are just extraordinary. Um, it's good that you say that because Lisa, our costume designer, is fastidious. I've never come across anybody so obsessed with detail as her. You know, we'll be leaving the, the truck with our costumes on and she'll be, her eyes will be scanning you and she'll be like, stick that, make that collar a bit stiffer, cover that button, fix that zip, iron that flatter. Like she's just meticulous. And, and I often just think, oh, come on, you know, it's all right, like surely I can just go now. And she's like, no, 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 it's got to be perfect. And look, I, I, I guess I want to share with you a bit about Lisa and I really because we talked before about Regina and and how she's created by her shoes and her wardrobe and her makeup and her hair. But Lisa and I graph her story each episode and we dress her according to the story. So when you watch each episode and you see what each character is wearing, especially I only speak from Regina because it's the only one I have contact with, you can chart how she's feeling and what she's wanting in every scene by what she's wearing. And that is 100% 100% true. And I've never worked on a show where it's been that interactive. So, you know, Lisa will be, and she and I'll talk and I'll be like, Regina's gonna have got her sexy on in this scene, so what are we gonna, what are we gonna put her in? And she'll be like, we're gonna put her in the red 
floral number because that's you know that's sexual and that's kind of what we want to do in this scene or the next scene I'll be like I've got to play demure Regina in this scene so let's put me in something kind of not very low cut very kind of country this you know all the different roles that Regina plays is all reflected by what dresses I wear and when you see there's one particular dress in season four and I won't tell you what it is but I'm really curious to know if you can work it out <laughs> when it goes to air there's one dress in particular that kind of is like the watershed dress it's kind of like the dress that says the most that kind of sets Regina on a path to where she ends up which is pretty out there so come back to me <laughs> when you've watched it and let me know if you've worked out which dress I'm speaking of. Uh, definitely. Um, Jenny, I want to ask you something, something else. Um, Marta told us um, about um, that she had read a lot of books and did a lot of research into her character. Um, you know, she read Ravensbrook and she did all of this really serious research. Um, have you read anything in the search for um, trying to capture um, Regina? I didn't have the same brief as Marta. I guess my research was more anecdotal because I was an Australian and I didn't have that um, terrible Holocaust experience. I guess the pre it was more, I, I kind of focused more on where the prejudices came from in Australia and also what it was like to be a woman in the 50s. You know, my mum, for example, was a great resource for me and my grandmother in terms of what, what it was like to be in Australia then. So you've given us a little bit of a hint. Um, give us a little bit more about what we'll see from Regina. We don't... I'm not in favor of spoilers. We really don't want to know what's going to happen, but we like a little tease. Okay, well, I had a lot of Epsom salt baths in my final block of filming. Do you guys know what that is? For you, yes. you soak your feet in Epsom salts, don't you, when they're swollen? Yes. I had to soak my entire body. Okay, Ooh. physical action. Oh, oh. <laughs> Um, are you, are, do you do a lot of riding on a horse or just getting a, a lot of getting beaten up? <laughs> <laughs> lots, lots of horse riding, yes, yeah. lots of horse riding, yeah. I mean, I, I, kind of, I can't wait for you to see it. It's, it's going to knock your socks off, that's for sure. It knocked mine off. I'm just barely recovering. <laughs> no wonder I had to dye my hair blonde again. Um, you know that, that those of us in the United States are going to have to wait until 2017 to see it. Because it doesn't come, it it doesn't come uh, as quickly to us as it does to you people in Australia. We it, we get we get it on Acorn starting the a week or two after it finishes its first run in Australia, and oh, we get good. and we get two episodes at a time. Well, that's good. That's good. Without commercial interruption. Wow, that's great. So we really say, when does the DVD get released in Australia? I don't know. It, it, so it, we really do get to see it like a movie. There is no commercial interruption, which makes it really, really very wonderful. Oh, well, I really hope that you enjoy the season. I mean, I'm you know I'm trepidatious because it's been so intense, but I I really, um, I really hope I want to know what you think after you've watched it. Um, Jenny, before we let you go, um, we're going to. Our um, technical advisor, David Bowles, um, is going to be posting this chat on our page uh, shortly after we, we finish. Um, any message for your worldwide fans and the thousand people who are um, on a, the international Facebook page? Yes, my message is please don't hold it against me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually nice in real life, it's true. <laughs> You, you're totally, totally different as a blonde. I mean, it really is an amazing, um, amazing transformation. And there, I don't think that there's anybody on the show who has that kind of physical transformation that you do. No, it's true. When I started, um, it was put into my contract that they had to take me back every, each time or, you know, after filming. And I've never needed to get rid of her as bad as this season. <laughs> 
I just <laughs> she had, she had to go. It was like enough, enough. <laughs> well, um, Jenny, thank you so so much for giving us your time. Um, I know the season's over, so um, I think we're probably uh, honing in a little bit on your uh, hiatus time. Um, I'm actually happy to promote it. I just hope people know who I am now that I don't <laughs> look like Regina. It was a bit of a thing like, God, what if I show up to things and people are like, could you get me a coffee? <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you want to say shalom? <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you want me to? Please. <laughs> Shalom. Oh. <laughs> Shalom, Sh Jenny. Sh Shalom, Jenny. Thank you so, so much. We look forward to having you back after season four is finished so we can rehash all these, uh, these uh, wonderful points. And well, I want to thank you. I guess I want to thank all of the fans, I suppose. I want to thank you all. Thank you for being so dedicated. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not lost on us as actors. I feel we're kind of, we are indebted to you in the fact that the show is still alive. So, thank you. Well, we look forward to, we hope that A Place to Call Home goes on for a while, but we know that it has to end. And what you can count on is that we're not just fans of the <coughs> role of Regina and the roles that each one of you play. Um, we love you as actors and performers. Um, there are all kinds of things posted. People are watching your old movies and posting um, pictures of you from all kinds of things. They are filling up the theater, you know, for Noni and, and Marta and Sarah. Um, you have some devoted fans. They're not just devoted fans of A Place to Call Home. They're devoted fans of um, Jenny Baird, the actress. So we mm. look forward to um, seeing you for a long, long time in a lot of different roles. You're here. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. And come visit me in Santa Monica when you come to Los Angeles. Oh, you're in Santa Monica. I'm, I'm, now I'm oh. in New York, but I'm back and forth. But I have a wonderful place, a rent-controlled apartment, right on the beach in Santa Monica. <laughs> wow, you lucky thing. <laughs> One of the smart things that, uh, that uh, we did was uh, yeah. move to Santa Monica when it was a sleepy little beach town and nobody wanted to live there. We we can't afford to live in Santa Monica these days, if only. Well, we you can definitely come and visit. Thank you so, so much. Thank and you. And we all. look forward to seeing you soon. Bye. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye, Jenny. Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs>